The NBR has been my home for more than three decades, and I mean my real home. <laughs> so the field of human capital was not invented by NBER researchers, but it was nurtured and it was expanded at the NBER. So human capital theory is the notion that investments in human beings today has a payoff in the future, and the investment can be in education, and training, and health, and job search, migration, and so on. So the human capital construct is really deep in the bones of economics, and finds mention, of course, in the classical economists. Smith mentions it, not by name. Marshall mentions it, not by name. Um, Irving Fisher mentions it by name. Uh, but neither the phrase nor the meaning we use very much for some time. So when did the usage of human capital spread? So we can find that out, of course, through the wonders of a Google engram using the English 2009 U.S. English corpus, uh, giving the fraction of volumes mentioning economics that also mention human capital. So this is a percent. This means of those books that are on economics, essentially, what fraction of those actually mention the exact phrase human capital? Okay. So hardly anyone used the phrase before 1960. But the phrase takes off, and by 2010, 16% of all books that are on economics essentially use the phrase human capital, and that's truly amazing. I checked phrases related to human capital, and they're not important. So this is a real change, and note the increase in the late 60s and also again in the 1990s. Now, usage of the term increased by more than six times from the first edition of Becker's Human Capital, that's in 1964, uh, to the third edition in 1993. And you can see Gary there with the Nobel that he won in 92, and also his hair combed. <laughs> now, we use the term human capital today as if it were always part of our lingua franca. But as we've seen, it wasn't. And part of the reason is that even economists not that long ago, and I can actually remember, scoffed at the notion of human capital. Free people were not supposed to be equated with marketable assets. To many, that would imply chattel slavery. In fact, Gary Becker admitted that he hesitated in 64 to use the term Human Capital is the title of his book, and he employed, he said, a long subtitle, and boy is it long, <laughs> a theoretical and empirical analysis with special reference to education to guard against criticism. Human Capital eventually became a staple of micro-theory, but it was actually called into being by the macro part of the economist's brain. The impetus was to understand the ever-expanding residual and growth accounting. NBR researchers such as George Stigler in 1947, Mo Abramovitz in 1956 were among the first to notice that changes in physical input measures could not explain changes in aggregate output. Kuznets bemoaned, and I quote, the con that the concept of capital formation was too narrow it should be broadened to include what he called investment in human beings. OK, so what did NBR volumes concern from 1920 when they began to 2020, where we are today? Now, to get at this subject matter, uh, I had my RA, who is sitting in the audience today, uh, go out and find all the Library of Congress codes for the more than 800 NBR volumes that have Library of Congress numbers, OK? And then we use those. We had to do that because these do not have JEL codes as of yet. And then we use those to code subjects that are more likely to use the human capital concepts, such as education, health, aging, children, labor, women, and migration. And you can see here the fraction of NBR published Volumes, these aren't the papers, these are volumes uh, that share these subjects. And that it didn't change very much until the 1970s, 
and then again in the 1990s. Okay, there is an anomaly, I've taken it out, and that's because the 1920s, there were only 16 books, and many of them were on, not surprisingly, international migration and immigration. Okay, so it may be understandable why the phrase human capital would not have been mentioned early on, but it is really less clear why so few NBR studies before the 1960s even mentioned the word education. That neglect seems very odd since, that was not supposed to happen, okay. It will happen soon. But that neglect seems very odd since educational advances in the US were already enormous, both in absolute terms and relative to educational improvements in other countries, as my book with Larry and articles that we've written have shown. The US had become a leader in education of its people. So how could NBR researchers have neglected such an important part of the US economy? And the reason was probably that they were just less concerned with the human component than they were with what I will call stuff. Stuff is stuff, ingots, wheat, corn. There are some exceptions to be sure, and the most important is Friedman and Kuznets's Income from Independent Professional Practice, published in 1945. That study was begun as a means to enhance national income statistics by Simon, but it morphed and it became the most controversial volume in the history of the NBER. Kuznets was the initial author, and he was preoccupied with his other studies at the NBER. And therefore, he hired a research associate who had a master's in economics from the University of Chicago, and that person was Milton Friedman. And the study became Milton Friedman's PhD dissertation at Columbia University, which he received in 1940. Note that the book was published in 45, those five years of the controversy. The Friedman and Kuznets research was important in a huge number of ways. Most of most relevance here is that it grappled with issues central to human capital theory, including investment under uncertainty, the financing of strangers, income contingent loans, equalizing differentials, non-competing groups, and the reasons for variability in individual professional incomes and differences in earnings across professions. That's a lot. The volume had enormous impact on a pioneer of human capital research, and that is Jacob Mincer. In 1957, after Mincer had written almost all of his dissertation on wage differentials, a fellow Columbia student said to him, have you read Friedman and Kuznets? <laughs> and showed him the book, and Mincer reminisced to me uh, many years ago. He said, the Friedman and Kuznets work was a revelation to me. I saw the light. He said, human capital became an integrating principle in my work. He then took back his dissertation, rewrote it, he said, in a number of weeks. He then showed it to his advisor, who then gave it to Ted Schultz, and Schultz invited Mincer to go to Chicago. And in 1957, Mincer went from Columbia to the University of Chicago. Also in 1957, the Carnegie Corporation of New York awarded the NBR funds to create a program on education, and Gary was invited to head it. As Gary said, the Carnegie grant was why I took the job at Columbia and the NBR rather than the high, higher paying one at the University of Chicago. He said, my book on human capital was an outgrowth of that project. And Mincer went from Columbia to Chicago in 57, and Gary went from Chicago to Columbia in the same year. And that began a magical period of human capital at the NBR more generally. In 1961, a university's NBR conference assembled a star-studded cast on human capital. <laughs> 
Becker on human capital, Mincer on on-the-job training, Shostet on migration, Stigler on modern search theory, Weisbrot on education, Dennison on, edu on economic growth, and augmented labor, Mushkin on health. I think of this as the human capital Oscars and Emmys rolled together. That became a 1962 JPE volume. In 1967, a health program was established under the direction of Vic Fuchs. In 1970, Schultz wrote a volume on human capital for the NBR's 50th anniversary colloquia, and Schultz then headed another NBR conference, also a JPE volume, that expanded the human capital paradigm to include marriage, the family, and fertility, with up-and-coming young people like James Heckman. Human capital began to change research at the NBR and altered it more than it did economics in general. How can we determine that? By categorizing books and papers by whether they reference human capital. But NBR working papers didn't ask for JEL codes until the 1990s. And EconLit didn't use modern JEL codes until 1991. So what I do is I look at the period after 90, and we can use JEL codes from EconLit for books and articles, as well as words in the titles and the abstracts. So this isn't searching the bodies of the paper, but just the abstracts, the titles, and there are only two JEL codes that mention the word human capital. So let me summarize this quickly. Here you can see the fraction of all economics books from 1991 that reference the term human capital in the way I just said. This is all books. There are a lot of them. This is bureau books. And you can see that bureau volumes aren't much different, but around 2000, they become very different. Similarly for articles, OK. This is all published economics articles that reference the phrase, this is the fraction of them that reference the phrase human capital in the title, the abstract, or in these two JEL codes. The same thing for NBR working papers. Once again, by the 2010s, NBR working papers have far more human capital content than all published papers. What does this tell us about the NBR? Has the NBR just added disproportionate strength in human capital? Or have all fields begun to use human capital more? And the answer is actually the latter. All programs publish working papers in human capital. Trade, development, EFG, DAE, urban, PF, innovation, productivity, corp finance, all using the, the notions, the concept of human capital. OK. In sum, I noted earlier that the term human capital is very popular in economics books. What about business cycles? <laughs> Here the comparison goes back to 1900. At the NBR and more generally in economics, we are no longer business cyclists. <laughs> At the end of the NBR's first century, one can confidently say that we are all human capitalists now. Thank you.